Okay, now that we have our implementation plan in place, you should have XNA Game Studio Express installed, and you may have figured this out, you may not have. You can run XNA Game Studio Express, and what you're going to see is the Visual Studio IDE pop-up, or you could just run the regular Visual C Sharp Express Edition. Either way, basically, if you take a look at the properties of XNA Game Studio Express, it's the same properties in regards to the application that runs as C Sharp Express. So, I mean, you're going to see the same thing, okay? Again, it's just some changes that have been made for XNA, all right, and Xbox 360. So we're just launching our regular Visual C Sharp 2005 Express Edition, but check it out. Here's how we know that we've got XNA installed properly. Logan, let's go ahead and create a Windows game. All right, let's go and begin a new project. And from here... Ooh, we've got some new stuff now. We've got a Windows game, Windows game library, XNA 3, Xbox 360 game, Xbox 360 game library, and we got a starter kit, the Space Wars uh, starter kit, both for Windows and for the Xbox 360. Very cool. Now, our focus right now is strictly on a Windows game, which means the way that we're coding this in regards to some of the things like resolution would have to be different if we were coding this for an Xbox 360. That's outside the scope of this very simple project, and it's something we're going to talk about much later on when we start dealing with the Xbox 360. But let's go ahead and get started with a Windows game. Okay. Now, you'll notice with the Windows game project, as opposed to just a standard Windows application, we have a section dealing with the folder location. What this means is that as soon as you create this project, the, fol the folders and files get laid down. That's right. So remember, remember in the past with a regular WinForm application, we needed to go in there and actually save our project before the folder existed. Once Logan clicks OK here, the Windows Game 1, if you look down there at the solution name, that folder is going to actually exist. Okay. So we'll hit OK. As a matter of fact, we could show that. I could bring up the projects folder. And there it is. You'll notice we immediately have a Windows game one. Okay, fantastic. Let's go ahead and minimize that. And before we start doing anything else, I just wanted to point this out to you. Check it out. We said create a Windows game, and we already have this code framework in place for us. Sweet. First of all, if we come up here and take a look at our using statements, Wow, look at this. So, of course, we're using system. We're using system collections generic, but then we've got all of this Microsoft XNA framework, framework audio, content, graphics, input, storage already all set up for us. Let's go ahead and move down a little bit further and just take a look at some of the goodies we have in place. So here we are starting out with our class Game 1, which is inheriting from the Microsoft XNA framework Game class. Now, moving down a little bit lower, we have a few things set up for us. These will be talked about in Volume 2 of the course. Moving down a little bit further, we have our Game 1 constructor. Okay, so we have our constructor. We have initialize. Remember, we talked about initialize. We have load graphics content. We have one that we haven't talked about yet, and we'll be getting to this later. We have unload graphics content. We have update. And finally, we have draw. Now, it looks like a lot of stuff, and this may look very overwhelming to someone who is still relatively new to programming. Don't stress it. Basically, what you're seeing for the most part is a whole lot of XML document comments, okay, which is great. Microsoft's helping you out by saying, all right, check this out. This is what this method's going to do. This is what this method's going to do. Just a lot of documentation that is embedded within our code here to help bring you up to speed as to what these methods are supposed to do. Don't get stressed out about the code that's already in place. Okay, we will leave that there. So I want you to follow along with everything that Logan's going to do now so that you can get your very simple XNA application going. And actually, Logan, before you start, it'd be cool to show him this. This is fully functional. It is. I mean, you can run it right now. Let's run it. So he hits F5. Look what we get. Now, it's not the most exciting application in the world, but we do have a window with the, what is that, the cornflower blue background color. Ooh. And, um, yeah. There you go. <laughs> so go ahead and close that. I just wanted to show everybody that that does indeed exist. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. Let me pull out my implementation plan. All right, so create a project. We have done that. Next thing, files. Let's go ahead and copy the target PNG from Canon 2 or Canon 1. doesn't matter. Okay. Let me bring up our projects directory again, and I'll jump into Canon 2. And inside the Canon 2 directory, we'll drop down to our bin folder. We'll grab debug, and this is where we placed all the graphic files for use in Canon 2. I'm going to steal the target, because that's that nice round circle-shaped object. Okay. So we'll copy that, 
jump back up to the projects folder, and then I'll jump inside of our Windows Game 1. And this is the, uh, let's see, inside of Windows Game 1 is where I want to drop it, but there's a specific folder that I want to place this file in just so that it makes sense inside of the Solution Explorer when we add it as an asset. Okay. And so in order to do that, check out how I'm going to add the, uh, the folder. I'm actually going to go to the uh, project itself, add the folder from here, call this, I'll call the folder Textures. And now if we jump back out to the project folder, you see Textures gets added, and that's where I'm going to drop the file. So we're dropping it inside of the project and in, instead of next to where the executable ends up going. Okay. So we've got this target.png. Now, you had said that we're loading this in as an asset. That's we right. We need to do that inside of the Solution Explorer. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click on our new textures folder, and I'm going to go to Add Existing Item. Inside of here, we're presented with the project folder, so I'm going to jump into our textures folder. And from here, I need to come down and switch the type of file over to Content Pipeline Files. And this will give us our target PNG. So I'll hit Add. We get the target PNG added. And we can see in the properties that it's set up as an asset. We've even got the asset name presented to us. So from now on, this is how we need to refer to it in code. That is correct. Okay, so now that we have our resource set up, let's go ahead and create some variables. We'll start out with our constants. All right. Let's jump in right um, actually before even the uh, graphics and content manager. I'll jump up a few lines, and now we need uh, our constants for screen width and screen height. These will be constant ints, and the first one is screen width, which we will set to 640 just to keep with a lot of the games we've been creating so far, and programs we've been creating. The next will be the screen uh, height, so const int screen height, and that will be 480. Alright, now Let's go ahead and define some constants for how wide the uh, the actual graphic itself is. I know we could look into the texture and find that and all, but just to keep with what we've been doing so far, we'll just explicitly define it ourselves in a constant just to make it really clear and easy to use later. Okay. So I'll make a constant int texture. Think it's texture. Well, if you're caught up in a situation where you're having to look into the texture to extract the dimensions a lot... That might not be very efficient, eh? Right, you might want to have a simple variable just so you can have one simple cached value to look at instead of something that's possibly dynamic. So we want to define our texture width and our texture height. And these are set to 32 by 32 because that's the size of the graphic that we're using for target. All right, now let's set up some constants for the velocity of the, uh, of the object. These will, again, be constants, but this time they will be floats. Since we were talking about working with vectors, and the vector has two float components instead of int components. Right. So this just keeps with that and also allows us to leverage the, um, the accuracy. That's what we're looking for. Okay. No, precision. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> this allows us to actually leverage the uh, precision of decimal points if we wanted to. Okay. So we'll have a const float uh, velocity x. We'll set that for now to 5.0f and const float velocity, that uh, begins with a v, velocity y, and we'll set that to 2.0f. All right, that should take care of our constants. Okay. So what did you want to look at next, the sprite well, batch or the uh Yeah, let's item. go ahead and let's go and create the sprite batch. Last time I almost accidentally left it out, so we'll get it in right away. We need some sort of object that's going to handle drawing our texture, so let's get it in place. Okay. This will be a sprite batch, and we're going to just call the variable itself sprite batch. If I can spell it right. Uh, e batch. And I simply named it with uh, camel casing, okay. just to keep it uh, clear what it is. And now we can define some things like what, uh, how are we going to hold the texture, and then store a uh, position and a velocity so we can have this move around the screen. So let's look at the texture. The texture is going to be of type texture2d, and we're simply going to call it texture. Now we need to store a position and a velocity, and these are going to be of type vector2. So we'll have our vector2 for position, position, and we'll have a vector2 for velocity. All right. 
that should take care of variables. All right, very nice. So taking a look back over here at the implementation plan, the next thing was inside the constructor, let's go ahead and set up our preferred back uh, buffer width and height so that we can define our screen width and height. Okay. Preferred back buffer width and height are found within the graphics object itself. So I'll jump in one line right below gra where graphics is created, and then we'll address the uh, width and height. So we'll take our graphics object, we'll set its preferred back buffer width to be equal to our screen width that we had defined, and set the uh, graphics preferred back buffer height to be the screen height. And once again, this is setting our resolution, basically. All right. Okay. And because we happen to be running on Windows, we are allowed the luxury of changing the size of the display if we want. All right, so now that we have this set up, let me just point this out. The Graphics Device Manager and the Content Manager, both very important in XNA games. We will be visiting, visiting these a lot heavier in the future. Right now, just know that we need them. If we're talking to our Graphics Device, we need our Graphics Device Manager, and that's why we've got the object set up right there. You can see, basically, we're saying, hey, Graphics Device Manager, let's go ahead and set up our preferred back buffer. And the content down there, you see that that is basically a new content manager. Content manager becomes very important, too, because you'll see shortly it's going to, well, allow us to easily load our texture over into our texture object. Okay? So, next thing we have on the implementation plan, Logan, was in initialize. Let's go ahead and create our sprite batch. Okay. Let me jump down a few to initialize. And... I'll actually wipe out the comment that says to do add the initialization logic because that's what we're about to do. Okay. The first thing we want to do is create the sprite batch itself. So I'll address sprite batch and say that sprite batch is equal to a new sprite batch. Now, when being created, sprite batch takes in a graphics device because internally that's what it uses to draw stuff. So we'll access graphics dot graphics device to get to the graphics device itself. Okay. Now we need to set up a velocity. Okay. We need to take our velocity vector and set that to be equal to whatever we had in that velocity x and velocity y constant. So we're going to need to set this to a new vector 2, and then we can take in our velocity x and our velocity y. All right, very nice. Now, implementation plan calls us to move on to our load graphic content. All right, so over so our load graphics content, and I want to jump over to the section that is for uh, if load all content. Inside of here, what we need to do is we, we want to set up our texture 2D. So we want to take our texture, and we want to create a new texture and store it in it, except we're not going to use new texture because we want to reference this asset. We use the content manager to reference assets, and we have a content manager stored in content. So we can address content, we can tell it to load. And load is going to take in a type, and we want to tell it that what we're loading, we want to load uh, something into a type texture 2D. Then we need to specify what asset. So I'll do an opening parenthesis. I'm going to start this uh, string with an at symbol, and I'll uh, to say why in just a second. So I'll do at symbol, opening uh, double quotes, and we'll say textures uh, backslash target. Oh, still missed it. Close. <laughs> so close. All right. Target. Right. And then close the uh, quotes, close the parentheses, and terminator. What I was doing here with the uh, at symbol is making it so that anything inside the quotes will be taken literally instead of using the backslash for an escape character. Okay. And All right. So now we're referring to target. Right. And again, the reason we're using target and not target.png is we're now looking at this as an asset and not a file. Again, if I click on it and look at its properties, we can see that the asset name is target, and that's how we need to address it here. Now, because it's in a folder inside of textures, I had to address it with the full name to that asset. Okay, very good. All right, so the next thing we need to do is move on to update, and this is where we're going to go ahead and update position and check for collisions and all that good stuff. We want to go ahead and build real quick so those that are following along know that they can check to make sure that everything's going to compile just fine. Sure, if I build... We build, we wait, and, and there you go. other than a warning, everything builds fine. Okay, perfect. All right, so now time to go ahead and start focusing on updating our position. Okay. Let me scroll down until we get to update, and let me wipe out the comment noting that we need to update stuff here, and we can begin. First thing is, again, to update position. So we'll take our position vector, and we'll say a position 
is plus, incremented by or plus equals velocity. As simple as that. So remember, that's the same thing as saying position equals position plus velocity. Right. And that's one of the nice things about using vectors is that we don't have to address the individual components. We can take one entire vector and increment it by another vector. Okay. All right. Now for the fun stuff, getting into collision checking. So again, like you were saying with the, the little uh, screen diagram, we need to see if the, um, the object, if the position, has gone off screen on any of the four directions, top, bottom, left, or right. And if it indeed has, we need to reverse direction and then update our position. Okay. So let's start some of these checks. Let's first check for X and see if we've gone off the left side of the screen. Ah, the easy one first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we want to check our position. We want to see if the position dot X is less than zero. And if it is, then we've gone off the left side of the screen. So if position dot X is less than zero, then we want to take our velocity. We want to take the x component of velocity and reverse it. So I'll multiply it by negative 1. Now, since we don't know how far off screen, screen we've gotten, we want to make sure that we go completely back on screen before we start updating again. So I'm going to take the position and update x to be equal to 0. So if we slid a little bit too far off screen, we get reset so that we're completely on screen again. OK. And that should take care of left side bounds. Now, I'll put in an else if, so we can do a check for the right side of the screen. And this check will be if the position.x is greater than the screen width, well, not screen height, screen width. Now, of course, we don't want to use the entire screen width because we have to account for the fact that our texture has width. We don't want to we'll let the texture go all the way off screen before we compare it. So we want to offset this and subtract it by our texture width. So that as soon as the right side of the texture goes off screen, then we calculate this as a bounce. So we'll block this in. And again, we need to reverse our velocity x. So I'll grab velocity.x and multiply it by negative 1. And we also need to make sure that we move the uh, texture completely back on screen. Just in case it slid off to the right a little bit. All right. So we'll take our x and set that to... Um, screen width minus texture width, so the value that we used to do the check. So just for um, speed's sake, I'll copy these and paste them in here. So set it to, if we've gone past the right edge of the screen, set it to be snugged up directly to the right side of the screen. All right, so that concludes our left and right checking. Now for up and down. For up and down, since the um, format of this is going to be similar, I'm going to copy this entire if-else block and jump down a line below and paste it in. Okay. Now we need to do things like change x to y and width to height. So let's check for the top of the screen, see if we've gone past that. So we'll say that if position.y is less than 0, then we've gone off the top of the screen. So we need to reverse the velocity in y and set the position in y to 0. Now we need to check and see if we've gone off the bottom of the screen. So we'll check to see if our position y is greater than our screen height. Minus our Oops, texture our, height. Throw your T in there. Oh, yeah. We need to spell stuff, right? So if screen height minus uh, texture height. So if we have indeed gone past the screen height minus the texture height, we count that as a collision. We need to reverse our velocity in Y. We need to set our position in Y to be snugged up to the very bottom of the screen. So, again, I'll copy what we had used for an offset, paste that in, and that should be all we need for collision code. All right, very nice. So let me do a build, just make sure I haven't introduced any errors. And nope, everything is fine. Very cool. And no warnings now that we're using position. So looking over the implementation plan. Oh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, you may wonder, why is he moving so fast and not showing us, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there that it, it's working, you know, that it's actually moving or this, that, and the other. Come on, we've done this. This, this is getting old now. We're just putting it inside a, a new framework of code, if you will. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and move to the final phase of our implementation plan, which was draw. Draw the texture using the sprite badge. All right. Though I do want to point out one thing interesting. Up until now, we've been dealing with what looks like positions and textures. If I were to run right now, we don't see anything. That's right. You've just been dealing with updating the, the state of the game, if you will. Right. This is just to underline the point that while we've defined a texture, that in and of itself isn't anything visual yet. The uh, drawing is entirely our responsibility. That's right. We've got to draw now. So let's do some drawing. All right. Let me jump down to the uh, draw section. Let me wipe out the comment, and let's start addressing the sprite batch. We need to tell the sprite batch to basically begin and get ready to draw. So we'll take our sprite batch, and we'll tell it to begin. 
and there are a few parameters you can feed that, but we're just going to leave it simple for now because we only have one. Now, after we begin, now we can actually draw a texture using the sprite batch. So again, we'll address sprite batch and we'll tell it to draw. Now, draw can draw a texture in a whole assortment of ways, but we're going to stick with one of the most simplistic ways. As a matter of fact, if I jump down one, we're going to use the one that takes in a vector for position because we happen to have a position vector that we're using so far. So the first thing that we need to take in for draw is a texture, which we have. We've defined texture. For position, again, that is our position that we defined and used in collisions. And finally, it gives us a color that it wants to use for tinting the sprite. If we use white, no tinting is applied. But if we specify some color, then we'll take out other colors so that we see the, uh, the desired tint color. But we don't want to affect the color at all, so I'll take color dot white and feed that so we don't have any apparent tinting taking place. All right, that will have our texture drawn. Now we need to tell the sprite batch to end and flush all the graphics out and have them drawn. So sprite batch dot end, and that should be that. Okay, and believe it or not, according to the implementation plan, we should be done. And if we go ahead and build and run, it should work. And the answer is, ooh, it works. So technically, we had some values moving around before the position actually bouncing off the sides of the screen. We just couldn't see it yet because we weren't drawing anything. Exactly. That's looking pretty good. So right now, you guys will take note that we never added timers. This goes to prove the point that we were talking about earlier that basically update is kind of like its own tick and draw is kind of like its own tick. It's like its own two timers. And they are decoupled, where we could, if we wanted to, specify draw to run at a different speed than update. So update is simply updating the position, excuse me, the position of our ball and taking into account anything that we may need to do to the velocity due to a contact with a side of our window. And draw is what is responsible for handling the actual drawing. And so every single frame, this screen is being redrawn. Okay? So anything else you want to add to that, Logan? Nothing I can think of. Again, this is all fairly straightforward. I know there's concepts that we haven't talked about in depth yet, things like content managers and, and such. Right. But, I mean, this is really all you need to get a simple app up and running. Exactly. Okay, so with that, that is going to wrap up this video, and we'll go ahead and move on to Canon 3's implementation plan. Thanks a lot.